wanna finish what you started? You came to the right place. Them girls that you came with, you might have to part with. Depending on how this thing shakes. Wabatosa, Kenosha, Economo Walk is in the house. And if- Welcome to another episode of the New Look Podcast, where today we're going to be taking a new look at the new look, which we will explain shortly. And we are very lucky to be joined by one of my heroes, Professor Richard Emmerman. Professor, thank you for joining us. My pleasure. So for those who don't know you, I need to state at the outset that with the possible exception of the Bible and (laughs) elements of style and maybe one or two other books, Waging Peace is uh, the book that has had a more profound influence on me than anything else, a book you co-authored with Robert Bowie. But before we get into that book, um, maybe we could start just how did where where did your interest in in Cold War history first come from or or rather, where did you first come from? Um, Well, I guess begin. (laughs) My topic sentence should be that I am old. (laughs) <laughs> um, I, I was uh, in college at Cornell uh, in the 1960s and early 1970s when the Vietnam War was raging um, and campuses were very much alive in terms of discussions of American foreign policy, the good, the bad, and the ugly parts of it. Um, I was studying with Uh, a hero of mine, Walter Lefebvre, um, who was in many ways sort of the dean of Cold War historians. Uh, I think that's a fair appraisal. Um, And in many ways, my interest evolved from that time. I was not alone. It was very difficult in the sense not to become interested in Cold War history during that time quite different from today, um, quite different from, in fact, by time we get to the 19, late 1970s and 1980s. Um, so that's really what triggered um, not just my interest, but my passion in learning more about what were the turning points, if you will, in terms of the evolution of America's Cold War policy, which then sort of morphed into this whole notion of learning more about what Cold War strategy was, a word that, frankly, was not used very much during those periods, except in very limited ways, mostly applied to the Vietnam War. Um, And so consequently, when I decided to go on to graduate school, which was not an immediate decision, Um, I had to take time to drive a taxi and do other things during (laughs) during that period. Uh, I knew I was going to, I didn't know, I was quite committed to studying foreign policy. I didn't know what areas of foreign policy it would be other than I was convinced it would be in the Cold War. Um, And ultimately that led me to the Eisenhower period, not so much by design as by serendipity. And what, so did you, so you took a few years between undergrad before you went to grad school. Right. Uh, where did you go to grad school? What, and, and at what point did you, did you, did you have to determine you were going to specialize in diplomatic history in general and a particular period of the Cold War in particular? So um, I went to Boston College. I uh, wasn't the most informed decision. I wanted to go to Boston. Um, they offered me the most money, which was not an irrelevant factor at those points. Um, I also I wanted to go to Boston in part because Cornell is pretty isolated in Ithaca, and it was I wanted to sort of rejoin sort of the human race in a way, and Boston was about compromise between what's real and what's not real. Um, So uh, and also they had a campus in which my dog could run. So I I don't want to go into any detail. It was not how I would advise my students to make their selection. (laughs) Uh, 
Maybe I mean, there's a historical lesson in there. Right. How the smallest there, variables can change the course of history, right. like dog it, it, running so outside. I recently wrote an essay on my sort of life for a uh, commissioned in which I discussed these sort of events, which is all about contingency in, in, in yes. many ways. Um, so uh, I didn't know what I was going to write about. And I, ca um, I not repeatedly, but on several occasions, I came across a reference in a book and in, in a couple cases, a chapter in a book that dealt with um, a CIA operation in Guatemala in 1954. Um, here I was in graduate school, having taken several courses in the history of U.S. foreign policy, and I knew nothing about this episode. Um, so I decided that's what I was going to explore against the advice of my advisors um, and um, many others, because a major reason why it had not been explored is many of the documents remain classified. Um, so I taught myself how to use this newfangled thing called the Freedom of Information Act, and I filed a number of requests. Um, I tracked down a number of the participants who were still around by that point um, and ended up writing my dissertation on this intervention in, in 54, um, which later was published and, and gained a certain amount of notoriety in part because it was really a new story. Uh, before the publication of that book, Book. I had been hired by, um, by Princeton University to be sort of an administrator and research um, position dealing with what came to be known as the Presidency Studies Center, where I worked intimately with a, a, a man by the name of Fred Greenstein, who was to a certain extent, sort of the dean or the father of Eisenhower revisionism. Um, this was in the late 1970s. The Eisenhower papers had just been opened up at the Abilene um, Library, the Eisenhower Library. Greenstein and I, both independently, were two of the first people to, to uh, go through those papers, which really presented a startling contrast with the caricature of Eisenhower, I think, that we had all grown up with. Um, so because I had worked on Guatemala, that appealed to Greenstein, because I actually knew a lot about the Eisenhower foreign policy, even though that had not been my focus. And from there, I just drilled down deeper and deeper into the administration, in the course of my further research, um, I interviewed Robert Bowie several times. We developed a relationship. Um, about a decade later, I'm really fast forwarding here, but in the <laughs> decade later, I organized a conference on John Foster Dulles uh, in which I did an oral history on this thing called the solarium exercise, which again, no one knew about. Bowie participated along with Andy Goodpaster, the, the, uh, the general, um, and George Tenen, who was involved and is, was quite well known. It was at that point that Bowie and I decided we wanted to write about sort of the evolution of the, the, the new look um, and, and Solarium. Bowie, because He'd been involved and was obviously very interested. Me, because by that point, I had been studying it for over a decade, probably more rigorously than, than anyone <laughs> ever thought that they were looking at anything that Eisenhower was doing. Um, and, and that's how it all happened. So basically, I came in through the back door of the CIA in Guatemala, um, and then it just expanded as I became increasingly fascinated with how this administration had put together a strategy, which, as you know, and as I've written, I maintain it is a model for any administration to follow, but none did or have. <laughs>
<laughs> well, I want to I want to go back to Greenstein and the idea of a hidden hand presidency. But before that, when you went into your Guatemala research, did you carry the ideological prior that Eisenhower was a figurehead who just played golf all the time and Dulles ran foreign policy? And in the course of that research, before you met Greenstein, did you start to reappraise your prior? So to answer the first question, yes. I mean, I certainly bought into the, the, the common narrative at that point that had been challenged by very, very few people. Um, few scholars, ironically, one of the people who challenged it was Richard Nixon, but who paid attention to Richard Nixon? <laughs> um, so uh, I did. That, that, you know, it was Dulles, and also in my case, it was not just John Foster Dulles, it was Alan Dulles. It, um, you know, it was Stephen Kinzer's book, you know, not that long ago, that the two Dulles brothers really ran the foreign policy. Um, I remember quoting Townsend Hoops and others that John Foster Dulles carried the State Department in his hand um, or his hat. Uh, and 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 pretty much did accept that and by and large with some modifications continues to accept it as i began to work with greenstein um we we used to meet every day fred was a political scientist i was a historian he studied advising and and the, the architecture of advisory systems um so the questions he asked were really quite different from the ones that I had. I was less interested in the mid 1970s when I began this work in how policy was made than I was with the outcome of that policy and the implementation of that policy. Greenstein was quite different. He was interested in the origins of that policy, the, the mechanics of, of how it, it came into being. And, we used to meet literally every day and discuss these issues. And I would go back out to the Eisenhower Library. He had a trove of, of documents. I then added to that, quadrupled the amount of people. Well, you know, Princeton, students were writing their, their junior projects and senior theses out of my offices bowling over their professors. How did they get all this information? It was what we had Xeroxed and brought back. Wow. Um, so in going through all of this, increasingly um, this, this, this image of the hidden hand, Eisenhower uh, came out. Someone who was much more um, actively involved in policy than we had ever known had developed a strategy of basically preserving his image and political capital without getting too far in front. Um, if he was going to take criticism, let Dulles take it because he was used to it. He'd always gotten that. And um, so that's really what it was. So I no less than um, my readers and those who listen to me and frankly, people like George Kennan were surprised by the image, by, by what we learned through all of these um, documents. But it really was not until it was the late 1970s that Greenstein and I began to work together. We pu both published articles 1979, 1980. Um, Mine had something to do with Eisenhower and Dulles, who makes the decision. He wrote something, Eisenhower is an activist president. And in many ways, those the, the conjunction of those two articles um, served as a catalyst for a growing sort of revolution in the understanding of, of Eisenhower. But that, you know, waging peace didn't come out for a decade later. So... Wow. We did a lot of work in between. That was part of it. You know, it took Bowie an awful lot and I a long time to sort of get this book the way we wanted it to be. So one technical question before we g g dig into Bowie. Um, well, one, would, do you do you refer to yourself as a diplomatic historian or is that the wrong phrase? 
For many years, I was a diplomatic historian, and then I got criticized for being a diplomatic historian because Why? Diplomatic historians were old fashioned people who did, you know, just read cables and foreign policy became, a, we, we can't understand, incorporated a lot of other things as well. So um, I am now a historian of U.S. foreign relations. I mean, that's sort of what it is. A lot of people call themselves international historians. I'm not really one of them, um, meaning that I tend to be Washington centric. I still study decision making and policy making, um, although I try to bring in and actually going back to my work on, on Guatemala, I try to bring in sort of the other nations, but it is primarily Washington centric. Um, but it's not only uh, sort of what we consider diplomacy um, and the diplomatic histori history, it, it incorporates a, a wider spectrum of, of sort of actors. Um, and the second technical question, at, before this revisionism started, how were we rating presidents and has that system for rating presidents stayed the same? Because it gets very technical, right? Yeah, no, it, it is. It's, it's, it's changed. So when 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 I began, um, certainly the, the rating game basically continues to be in the mechanics are very similar. Somebody sends out notification to, to all the presidential scholars. They can be historians. They can be political and said, rate your presidents. Um, when uh, and that's still basically done. That's what it is. And when they show these ratings, and, and I'll, I'll come back to that in a second, it's usually sort of the usual suspects are the people who, who have done it. And when when I began, there had been a, a poll conducted initially by Arthur Schlesinger Sr. Um, and then it got sort of a little bit more sophisticated, but basically it was the poll of Arthur Schlesinger Jr. And um, Eisenhower was ranked tied with, I think it was Chester Arthur, <laughs> or like the t tied for like twenty first or something like that. And the, by this point, there'd only been thirty some odd presidents. So bottom he, half. Well, he, right, certainly he wasn't ranked. You know, he's now in the top ten, um, and it, it varies. And he's leapfrogged over. A lot of people who at one point had been, um, you know, considered really top tier presidents and now not so much. And part who of it would be in that camp. Um, I'll give you a, a perfect example is James K. Polk. James K. Polk had been ranked very, I mean, listen, now most people don't even know who James K. Polk was. But James K. Polk came into office, served one term, said, this is what I'm going to do. He did it. And presidential scholars tended to applaud him for doing that. Um, you know, part of it was this image of an, an activist president who uh, sort of was the opposite of the hidden hand type, type of, of president. So Eisenhower was rated negatively because of this view that he had been more passive than a Richard Neustadt or a Clinton Rossiter or sort of the classic presidential scholars had suggested, including the Schlesingers. Ultimately, it became it's one and here again between Vietnam and, and, and Watergate, the general view was, well, maybe activism wasn't all that great if it got us into trouble in one way or another. And more documents came in. And then it also had to do with um, you know, we tended to uh, rate higher wartime presidents. Eisenhower had basically ended a war and kept us out of what many people expected would be a war. You know, in the 1950s, the general assumption is how can you avoid this thing? You have the Soviet Union and the United States sort of, you know, staring down each other. And um, so... Um, you know, as people began to think differently about the president and what constituted a successful presidency, a president who had not led the United States into war, as Kennedy and Johnson did soon thereafter, even if it wasn't a general war, it was a war, 
um, who had balanced the budget, who had passed civil rights legislation, even if it was not what what came later, but it had been the first since Reconstruction, um, began to go up. So now it, it sort of varies, but he's usually ranked now somewhere between sort of six and eight, which is pretty high, wow. considering you've got Abraham Lincoln and George Washington and Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, but he's now higher than Truman, who was rated significantly higher than than, than Eisenhower, but Truman wasn't so great to begin with as well. After all, he had left office pretty unpopular. I had looked at, you know, I had to study Truman in order to be able to historicize Eisenhower. So um, they were the two who I were well, both of whom now are ranked significantly higher than, than um, originally. So, OK, so you, you work with Greenstein, you, you publish uh, Eisenhower and Dulles, who made the decision. You have a, your book on CIA in Guatemala comes out. You write a confession of an Eisenhower revisionist in 1990. And your work with Bowie really intensifies then. Correct. Yeah. yeah that's so absolutely. let me let me quick tell my Bowie story uh, and then I want that to tee up your Bowie story. So here I am a. I think I was still on active duty. I was going to grad school. I I I forget how I first uh, uh, came upon this book, but I, I became fascinated by Project Solarium. I, I'm getting ready to go to Abilene to do archival research on Project Solarium, and I'm out one night with a bunch of friends, and w uh, a friend of my friend, this young lady, uh, I get introduced to, and we start talking, and she asks me what I'm working on. I say, I'm going to grad school. And I'm working on this weird thing called Project Solarium. She's like, what's that? And I start explaining to it. And then, you know, this is not something you usually bring up when you're talking to a young lady at a bar. But I said, you know, there's only these two guys that really have written anything about it. One's named Immerman. The other's name is Bowie. And she says, well, my name's Bowie. And I think, well, that's weird. And fast forward, her grandfather is Robert Bowie. And so through her... Uh, I then find myself a few weeks later driving to Bowie, Maryland uh, to interview Robert Bowie, who at the time I think was 101 years old. He yeah. printed out the draft of my chapter on size 72 font uh, and with a magnifying glass, read the whole thing, uh, was obviously physically sort of deteriorating at that point, but mentally lucid. It was incredible. I mean, it was like, and I think... That was the moment when my love of history in general, Cold War history in particular, just crystallized. And I think it was one meeting him, him being willing to read my work, but also just thinking he was there in the early 50s for this. So that's my Bowie story. I just talk a little bit about how you and Bowie worked together and 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 how the process the process that led to this book. Well, it was it was it was a remarkable experience. Um, and even had the book never been completed. Um, I think that I would have looked at this experience as one of the more rewarding ones that I'd ever had in my, in my life. As I said, I met Bowie by interviewing him about Eisenhower. I remember, um, I think the first interview had to do with the offshore islands crises, Kimoi and Matsu, which I was still trying to figure out. I'd say, and I'm still trying to figure it out, sort of all the different sort of variables that, that went into that. Um, Bowie had joined um, the administration in, I mean, it was actually after Solarium or right around the time of Solarium, he'd been brought in because he was had this legendary legal mind. And Dulles, uh, he'd been commended, to, recommended to Dulles. He'd, he'd done government. He'd worked with Lewis, with Lucius Clay in Germany, and he'd been involved in government. But he'd been a lawyer, and he'd gone back up to Cambridge. Um, and Dulles brought him down, basically to argue with him. To uh, Dulles loved, had a great legal mind as well, but he wanted someone to challenge his views. He was the sort of whatever the opposite of a sycophant is, is what Bowie was going to be. Not a devil's advocate, because it was going to be genuine. It wasn't just arguing uh, 
but the dollar, but but Bowie had this sort of mind. So I I interviewed um, Bowie, and I was working on a number of different projects at that time. And then I interviewed him again. And then I remember Fred and I invited him to Princeton several times. He'd been a Princeton undergraduate, so it wasn't exactly twisting his arm to to um, to come back. And um, we remained in, in, in touch, even when I left Princeton and I went out to teach it first at the University of Colorado and then the University of Hawaii, we remained in, in, in contact. And when I then came back to Princeton to organize this conference to celebrate the 100th, uh, the anniversary of, of the 100th anniversary of, of Dulles's burn, which I brought back pretty much everybody from the Eisenhower administration or the Dulles State Department, but really the Eisenhower, it just sort of, there, there was no distinction. Um, Dulles, he was the first one on my list um, because one, I knew him the best and who, who better to discuss Dulles's sort of legacy and, and his foreign policy than Robert Bowie. Um, and uh, we discussed, and as I said, I had organized this this oral history on solarium, and we decided at that point really that we would work on this book together. Um, I had, you know, my the, the 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 brash young historian said, "Well, sure, I'm the scholar. Who are you? Um, why don't we do it? it? Should be Richard Immerman with Robert Bowie." He didn't like that idea at all. This was going to be a totally co-authored book. Um, and uh, I then spent time, I would come back from Hawaii and I would go down to visit him. He had a, a wonderful place in Eastern Maryland on the shore. Um, and I used to spend weekends with him there. He also had an apartment in New York. Ultimately, he lived in Towson. I'm not sure exactly where you that they went to a retirement community there. He lived until he was 104. So, I mean, he was really pretty remarkable. And right around the time when you saw him before that, I'd been on a panel with, I'd been on a panel in, in Gettysburg to mark um, the, the Eisenhower, uh, Khrushchev's visit to Camp David. They did a special thing and he'd gone out to then Gettysburg and Susan was there and all. And, Bowie came. He was a spry 102 years old, I think, at that point. Um, his body had failed him, but his mind, he, he, he just never missed a beat. So in any event, we used to we worked on this together, both corresponding, but also on these weekends. Um, I got to witness firsthand sort of the, the, the Bowie treatment, which was basically to challenge everything that you said. Um, we would go over things and I would say, well, here are the documents. And he would say, yeah, but that's not what really happened. And um, it, it, was, it was tough for me in a lot of ways as a trained historian. Uh, Every history PhD student is shuddering at that statement right now. <laughs> I mean, I would show him the documents, but we would talk and it's, you know that documents don't always tell the entire story. And um, why I said it was rewarding is because Bowie had been there and he knew the people. He would sort of fill in the missing pieces. And there were times when I ended up um, framing arguments in a way that I probably would not have had I, one, not had this di discussion, but also that he would not let me sort of make an argument as, as sort of absolute that I was going to, to do, uh, do it, including, I remember, sort of major battles over the response to um, Eisenhower's chance for peace speech after Stalin died, which is a big part of sort of the story. Uh, but he also, it was because of Bowie, and you've seen them, I got access to documents that otherwise I never would have gotten access to because as someone who was involved in the production of documents, he got to look at them and then he would get them declassified. Um, and that included this sort of famous or sort of off the record meeting that Eisenhower had held with Dulles and others in the solarium that would that began that that document only reached the public domain because of Robert Bowie. Um, 
So uh, it, it was an amazing uh, experience. And as I said, we, we, we argued for 10 years about co-authoring a book is difficult under any circumstances. But when um, one of the principal authors is in his 80s and was a participant and the other one is like 40 and, you know, has a totally different background and experience. It, it leads to some really interesting exchanges. So uh, let's go. Let's go to that fateful day in 1953 in the White House solarium um, and just kind of tell us who was there, what were they talking about, what, and, and, and how did this all begin? Well, so uh, again, this is May, and, and um, we have to sort of place ourselves in the context okay. of what it was like. So the Cold War had been intensifying for the previous half dozen years at least, depending upon sort of, you know, historians still argue as to when the Cold War began. But let's just go back to sort of 1947, the Truman Doctrine, 48, the Berlin blockade. I mean, the all thing, it, it just keeps, and Eisenhower is elected um, as the person viewed as most capable of yeah. managing this intensifying Cold War, which is now, um, 1953 is also when the Soviet Union, 1949, the Soviet Union successfully tests an atomic bomb. 1953, it acquires a thermonuclear capability, the hydrogen bomb, the super bomb, whatever they want to call it. So you now have what in the Oppenheimer report, which came out and I'm just throwing out an awful lot of stuff at the same time, sort of two tarantulas facing themselves in a bottle. Um, and the Kore invasion of Korea, 1950, right. Correct. domestic spying cases across the United right. States. You know, McCarthy, um, domestic, there's no way to describe how tense the atmosphere was. And Eisenhower has a, the slimmest of all majorities in Congress um, to, to do, which is basically in, in the Senate hinges on William Howard Taft, the, 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 who's, who's, who actually is, is about to die or just died right before this. But he's sort of, he, he had challenged Eisenhower for the nomination. He's much more um, associated with the Asia first as opposed to the Atlanticist. Uh, more of a unilateralist, um, certainly not an internationalist as Eisenhower is, and that's that whole wing of, of what, what everyone is. So um, within this context, there, there's meeting, how are we going to deal with the Soviet threat? What are we going to do? How uh, is, is containment the policy that was in existence that Kennan and the Democrats had put together, which theoretically um, the Republicans had campaigned against in 1953. Uh, this was Dulles's plan, you know, that, that um, considered futile, cowardly, all sorts of different words. It did. What are we going to do about this? And Dulles begins this meeting by saying, man, time is, is not on our side. It's all running against us. The Atlantic Alliance, NATO, which is the sort of the centerpiece for uh, American foreign policy, it's a mess. It's and we're, a mess. In, we're in the solarium room we're now. We're in the solarium right? room. It's and just and like a, a, a place where Eisenhower entertained his friends and played you know, bridge right. and... Yeah. They had gone there, you know, because it was sort of it was a, a private off to me, totally candid. Uh, and although um, Dulles particularly had sort of sent out signals about his disenchantment with the current 
um, state of the alliance and of American foreign policy writ large, and in doing so had hinted that he was much more inclined to use atomic weapons as a diplomatic instrument than many had been comfortable at this time. It's not as if he had sent a memo ahead of time, this is what I'm going to discuss. So he said, he basically bared his soul. This is what I'm thinking. Time is against our side. The European allies are all sort of old, decrepit people and company, company who are never going to just to demonstrate the resolve and fortitude that we need in order to combat this um, this new threat. I mean, which he's he and others consider more ser serious than that of Nazi Germany. Um, and we have to do something. And he proposes a number of different options, um, none of which are to basically stick with what we have now. We have to be more uh, sort of aggressive and, and stronger in terms of one, uh, as I say, that, that he, he comes up with a number of, of really a couple of different options from rollback, meaning being more aggressive, to um, backing the NATO alliance with more sort of atomic threats, to drawing a line around the Soviets and say, if you take one step farther, we're going to reserve the right to respond in any way we want, um, which is sort of like I've waited, sort of the godfather. You know, yeah, no, not, right. no, you know that, and we're, we're going to respond Everyone knows what he's talking about. You'll be sleeping with the fishes if you That's cross right. the line. That's exactly yeah. what it is. So um, Eisenhower doesn't say you're wrong, although he raises questions about what he's saying. One, he does not. He's not nearly as, um, how do I put it? He, he's not nearly as pessimistic about the European alliance allies as Dulles is. Uh, he's never comfortable with, using nuclear to, with threatening nuclear weapons um in part because he says if you're going to be threatened them you have to be prepared to use them and that he sees the consequences as that of, of basically armageddon you know his thing is that the only he's already said it and he'll say it several times the only thing worse than winning and then losing a nuclear war is winning one because then look what you're left with that you have to manage i mean it's a really um, very sort of pithy view that he has. Uh, and he also, he's more optimistic generally than, than Eisenhower, um, than Dulles is. That time is not, time is on our side because we have a stronger system and we have better values. And all we have to do, he doesn't say that, is, is basically prevent a general war and we'll win. I mean, over time, we're going to win. I mean, I'm, I'm, this is reductionist, but that's general. I know. Well, he has this phrase, I think, it, or at least according to the, it's not a transcript, but the description, I forget who wrote it, where he says, it's men's hearts and minds that must be won. And then yeah. at 57, he says, we just have to convince the world that we're a better group to hang with than the commies. Yeah, so I think he, he has that longer term perspective. Right, that hearts and minds thing, um, I forget where it is, but it's in our book. I mean, it is a quote that, that he comes from. Um, and he's responding particularly to the military. The Joint Chiefs of Staff are ultimately, they, basically, they also subscribe to the time that um, time is against us. And what Mark Trachtenberg will later are, write, it called a wasting asset, that we now have nuclear superiority, but it's not going to last for very long. So we have to exploit it. Um, so it is this conversation that Eisenhower uses to propose this incredible exercise in which he divides what he calls sort of the best and the brightest, all these young men, some of them are not so young, um, but because, you know, like Kennan and others are, are involved in it, to view these different options. One is basically to, con to um, continue the present policy of containment, but perhaps to strengthen it, which means really to strengthen the alliance. 
Um, the second is to draw a ring around the Soviet bloc, as it is. And I say the Soviet bloc because that would include Eastern Europe and those nations now that we acknowledge has basically come under Soviet um, tutelage, if you want to call it, the sort of satellites, but it's also China and other Asian areas. Um, and then thirdly, though, the third option is to liberate, is, is liberation, rollback, to take aggressive measures, um, mostly short of war, but that's, that, that, the line between war and, and peace is not so clear. Um, and they're going to debate them. It's also proposed that we, we, look, we review the option of preventive war, but that's ruled out. So solarium is only those three exercises. Um, they develop, they, they divide up into teams, team A, B, and C, to argue these different uh, sort of options. Each one of them gets um, sort of sequestered in the national, uh, at that point, what is it? The, it's now National Defense University. It's is it the National where, War College back yeah, then? Right, yeah, yes, it's the National War College at that point. They, they hide out for six weeks, only six weeks, but it is pretty amazing that they put the, the, the six weeks. They have access to all the current intelligence. Um, they, they begin in June. On July 16th, they have this big meeting. Eisenhower is there in which they present their cases. They've also written reports. Uh, they, they're really pretty incredible. Um, it's really, it's quite clear at that point that Team A, which is led by Kennan, which is an advantage, um, is probably the most. You need to stipulate Wisconsin native George Kennan on yes, this podcast. Yes, Wisconsin native. <laughs> and and um, biographers of, of, of Kennan will say that always stayed with him forever. Uh, <laughs> Kennan, who had been dismissed unceremoniously from the Foreign Service by John Foster Dulles. By John Foster Dulles, right. He's dismissed by not being appointed to a new position. That's how it works. So it's not like he's fired. He's just, he, he's, he, he just, there's no place to go. And that's how the State Department works. So he then retreats to the Institute for Advanced Study, which isn't a bad place to hang out. Um, comes back for a short time under Kennedy, but the, yeah, he's not that. And that's one of the things about this conference is that uh, Kennan is, is, is really quite hostile towards um, Dulles throughout and throughout his leg because he also blames Dulles for the problems that some of his closest friends uh, had with McCarthy and others in the State Department in the 1950s. But he's no one is more impressed with the new diplomatic record as it comes out than Kennan, the, the Dulles who emerges and the Eisenhower who emerges. Well, not the Eisenhower, because he does say that when when Eisenhower gets up at this meeting, a solarium, he demonstrates his intellectual ascendancy over everyone that's in his room, which is that was one of the things that Eisenhower revisionist picked up on, but no one else did. I mean, he interesting. They didn't. They just didn't believe him when he said that Eisenhower actually was more than the golfer and the paint by numbers guy. Who, by the way, was Bowie? Am I right in saying Bowie was there for was, the yeah, final he, presentation? Yeah, he was at the presentation, but he was not involved in the. He had just been brought in. Yeah. But the people who were there, he was the State Department representative to the National. Security Council Planning Board. Um, and uh, it was through that position that he was there, but also he was involved in um, the, 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 the National Security Council and really the planning board using Solarium as a centerpiece, but other piece that to develop what comes to be NSC 162-2, which is generally the, the new look document, although there's also a military component to it. So before we drill down on what is in the new look, what role did Andrew Goodpaster play in the exercise? And by the way, I've unsuccessfully tried to convince my wife that we should name our first child Goodpaster Good Gallagher, <laughs> because I think Goodpaster is like the most underrated 
figure uh, of American foreign policy in the last few decades. Yeah, well, I mean, he, he is. And, and in fact, um, it's a, so, so good pastor is a colonel at, in these days. I mean, you know, that's a, just a colonel, but he's a colonel. I mean, you know, he, he becomes um, Eisenhower's staff secretary. The original one is a guy named Pete Carroll. He dies. Uh, and but good pastor um, uses that position to really develop what becomes now we would think of as the national security advisor. Uh, but the national security advisor at that point was was Bobby Cutler. It was the White House assistant who was a coordinator. Um, he pulled together, although sometimes he, he transgressed or went beyond that role. But he was the one who managed the national security process um, by collecting all the papers and setting the agendas. It was good pastor who briefed the president, for example, on that and met with him. That, but good pastor was a young guy at that point who Eisenhower clearly recognized was incredibly bright and talented. Um, this is before he went off to Princeton to get his PhD. Um, so uh, as good pastor tells this story, and we don't have any documentary thing, is that Eisenhower insisted that uh, good pastor serve on this task force C. Task force C was the one you recall that was to advocate for rollback, for more aggressive measures to roll back that Soviet orbit as opposed to containing it, whether it be by um, sort of economic and, 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 and diplomatic and other means, or by basically threatening to bomb Mac to drop a nuclear bomb on Moscow if, in fact, there's, there's a problem on the periphery. Um, and according to good pastor, Eisenhower asked him to do this in order, or I don't think he asked him, so you're serving on this, right. um, because he didn't want it, he wanted it to be a legitimate, not a sort of crazy, reckless policy that would be taken seriously. So he, so Eisenhower had such confidence in, in Good Pastor, even in those early days, that he was going to ensure that you sort of no one that, uh, Task Force C didn't come out and say, yeah, we're going to unleash sort of conventional as well as paramilitary and other things. It wouldn't be military, um, atomic weapons, although if it was too aggressive, it would likely, it could very well trigger a, a Soviet nuclear response, and that would lead to the general war that, that Eisenhower wanted to avoid. avoid, avoid. So, OK, so three teams, seven people each, the brightest minds of the day, six weeks of work culminating in a day long debate in front of the president. Eisenhower gets up there. He summarizes the report. I think he said I don't know if he says it or he writes it in the marginality that he's struck by some of the similarities. He's struck by the genuine conviction that some people have in, in advocating for their proposal. But it's a big but because I think this is what people miss about Project Solarium. It's not as if the new look sort of emerges from that room. In fact, yeah. there, I think a lot of people in the room did not agree with the president that there was a lot of consensus or similarity. That's so he exactly. then tells the NSC to cobble together the work of these reports into what ultimately becomes the new look. So, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong in any of those points, but then tell us what is the essence of the new look and which of those task forces proves the most influential? So, um, so first of all, I mean, he, he, he doesn't rest right in the margins. He does say it. He, he, he gets up afterward, and this is what, what prompted the Kennan comment about his intellectual ascendancy, is he speaks for 45 minutes without notes, um, in which he, he goes through these, and then he does say that, yes, there's more in common than, than people are aware of, um, and he wants some sort of synthetic statement of national security policy. That's what it's called, which we now would call a grand strategy. Um, and uh, that then, and well, yeah, all, all 
And everybody, I mean, we do have evidence of this. All of the task force members said, the guy's crazy. I mean, <laughs> I said this, we did this. It doesn't. But they put together a, um, so first there's a solarium committee, subcommittee, and they're going to work on it. And then it's going to go to the, the planning board and they're going to work on it. And there are going to be these other inputs that, that come in, not just from solarium. And they're going to hammer out some sort of uh, statement of strategy that incorporates on instructions from Eisenhower, these different views. Um, and at first they come up with a draft and it's pretty wishy-washy so that their way of um, incorporating this is to basically compromise. Here's the least common denominator. And Cutler says, this isn't going to cut it with the president. You, you, we have to be specific. and. They really begin at the so. What is the greatest threat confronting the, the administration, the, the the United States? And here, there's already a debate because you know, for the bulk of the people and the people working on this, of course, it's the Soviet Union, or maybe it's the Sino-Soviet alliance, but also involved and involved on the National Security Council are representatives of the Bureau of the Budget and the Treasury. And they say, you know what the greatest threat is? It's to America's economy that we're going to bankrupt. We can't spend all this money because we're going to bankrupt. Thing. And, and Eisenhower had campaigned on this. He's a fiscal conservative. So um, I, I mentioned that just sort of how I mean, almost every issue, there, there is debate over it. So ultimately, what did they do? The NSC 162 begins with saying the United States confronts two life-threatening threats. One is the Soviet Union, communism, but it is the Soviet Union because China is still perceived as sort of an appendage of that. But it, we were talking about a lot of territory, so this is a pretty severe threat. But it's also the, the, the vitality and the viability of the American economy, because if, Amer if, if Americans don't prosper, um, not only is that going to weaken us at home, but the public are going to demand that the United States take an America first, um, fortress America type of approach. I mean, even today's the, the debate, there's a lot of it, it all goes back to then. Um, and they're going to demand that the United States withdraw its troops from abroad, including from NATO. Um, so ultimately, that is the, the, the uh, you know, the twins threat. And then it follows then what 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 is the strategy we are going to use to achieve our goals, which are both to to um, counter and ultimately uh, eliminate the Soviet threat. And then secondly, to do so while keeping the United States economically strong and prospering and growing. Um, and it has different instruments that come. So to, to answer your question, ultimately, um, it is Task Force A that is the most dominant of the, the, of, of the three, um, but it's not alone. So for example, um, the Truman administration had spent a lot of money building up America's atomic and then nuclear stockpile, but it had not fully integrated it into America's force structure and defense posture. So the new look borrowing from B said the United States is going to use its conventional um, forces as a deterrent and, and if necessary, but behind it is going to be the American atomic uh, stockpile. And in fact, um, Eisenhower was always very, how do I put it? He, he, was, he was not comfortable with relying heavily on our conventional forces, not because he didn't think they were going to perform, 
but he was concerned that if the Soviets perceived the United States as placing too much emphasis on its conventional force, it might not think that the United States was willing to respond to aggression with its atomic or nuclear forces. And therefore, the Soviets would miscalculate, invade, and then the United States would have to respond. So it was really a balanced um, sort of conventional nuclear, but those nuclear forces were going to be fully integrated into America's defense posture. Um, but again, it was always tricky because it was you have to build this, but without making our European allies so nervous that they, they would think that the United States was going to place them in between sort of, you know, that they were going to be vulnerable. This, of course, was the problem that, that sort of uh, Nixon and Carter and all would have to deal with later, the notion of decoupling, um, you know, sort of Europe from the United States. So... Uh, Nuclear weapons were very strong, but there was also going to be a tremendous reliance on psychological and other type of warfare to be able to combat, which they thought was the real threat. The general view was that the Soviets were not going to invade Europe, but they were going to do everything they could to destabilize Europe, to subvert, the, to, 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 um, to weaken Europe, so that there also had to be sufficient attention, not just to psychological warfare and other propaganda to to give um, to boost the morale of the Europeans, but also to trade and economic measures to be able to to sort of bolster the, the economy and make them less. Um, so you, basically, you had this pyramid structure in which here are the two threats. And here are all the different instruments that are going, the United States is going to exploit in order to be able to, to as I say, both um, challenge the, the, the European. The economy is the trickiest one, really, because yeah. um, one of the things that they do is they say, we're not going to balance the budget by 1954 or even 1955, as George Humphrey, the Secretary of Treasury, and Joe Dodge, the bureau, they want. We're going to do it over, over time. I mean, we're not going to just sort of, uh, I, as I said, Truman had, had built the stockpile, so we don't have to spend as much money on nuclear yeah. weapons. That also, by the way, is where, where Sputnik comes in. But, um, uh, but we, we can sort of rationally do this and therefore over time and ultimately that's what happened is that they were able to they they still spent a lot on defense um but it wasn't like panicky we got to put off all, all this money we're going to do it sort of rationally he uh he he, he changed and eisenhower would say you know i know something about how we you do defense budgets um you ask for the world and then you cut back we're, we're going to make sure that what uh, the military requests are what we think is absolutely necessary and everything was reviewed and all national security um, policies, all their strategies had to come with a budget annexed to it so that they would knew, know how much it, it cost. So did, I, I guess to get to the debate about Solarium, did Eisenhower rig the game or did he allow the process to affect his analysis? Both. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, it is, that, well, that's like any good historian never straddle the fence. Um, he he absolutely let the process played out. I mean, these were were the brightest people, but he was pretty confident in how it was going to turn out because this was a guy who came into the office with unparalleled experience in 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 both foreign affairs and military matters. And um, he rigged it in the sense, and, and man, we don't have evidence of this, but the fact that George Kennan was the, the, the head of um, Task Force A had already written this and was a tremendous wordsmith, that there was no way the Task Force A, which is, is basically was quite consistent with Eisenhower's overall views, 
um, wasn't going to be very persuasive. And in fact, Task Force C never even wrote a coherent report in the, in the same way because they were scrambling to do something that had never been done before. Uh, but that's not to say that a number of the arguments that were in Task Force C, and a lot of it is still classified, so we can't see, about um, the advantages of putting pressure on the Soviet regime so that it would it, it wasn't free to be able to be as venturous as it was, was not part of the new look. I mean, it did rely um, and, and sanction, as we later we would learn, Sue, whether it be in, in Iran or Guatemala or other places, that we would use covert and paramilitary things to put pressure on areas that we thought at the time, and whether we were or not is really not the point, but thought were perhaps going to, to be influenced by the Soviet Union. Soviet Union did not expand during that time. Um, and we also did rely heavily on the nuclear deterrent to um, back up the, 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 the conventional one. Um, but I think it was quite clear that the Soviet Union were aware that the United States, and here's where the offshore islands were, that if push came to shove, the United States, I mean, Bowie told me this. He had absolutely no doubt that if Eisenhower felt it was in the national interest, he would have used America's nuclear arsenal. Um, wow. He hoped to use it in tactical ways, but he would have. And this was a guy who had been through war. And, you know, he, if Bowie thought that, you could be pretty sure that Khrushchev did as well. <laughs> I love that. Uh, was Eisenhower willing to adjust course or revisit the premises of the new look in response to crises like Suez or, or Sputnik or things throughout his administration? Yeah, well, he, he never saw NSC-162 or any of this as a blueprint. It was a general outline um, so that, uh, and they did, they were visited every year. They would do a, 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 a revision of it. But Eisenhower's general view was that um, in order to be able to effectively respond to a crisis, Suez, Sputnik, Berlin. I mean, they were all through that you had to have a baseline so that you could um, make an informed decision as to how to respond. So this would, in this case, uh, nothing should be done that serious risk, seriously risked undermining the Atlantic Alliance, that the Atlantic Alliance was fundamental to America's strategy because the United States could not go it alone. Um, it would bankrupt us to try to do it. We needed the Europeans. So even in something like Suez or Berlin, in which there was real tension in the alliance, whatever you did, you had to make sure that that alliance emerged intact. Maybe a little frayed at the edges, but it would be sort of intact. Um, that you had to continue. So the the original, um, how do I put it, Ge general uh, thrust of the administration was known by trade, not aid, that the United States would rely on its trade to um, promote the economies of both its European allies and also in the developing world without um, giving aid, in other words, direct grants and, and loaning money and doing things. By the end of the administration, it had changed dramatically in that. It wasn't being affected, particularly in the developing world. So it developed what was essentially an Alliance for Progress program by the end, which you find nowhere will you find anything remotely close to that in the original new look. George Humphrey could never sanction anything like that. It all had to be based on trade. 
But Eisenhower realized that that wasn't enough. And his goal was to make those that, that developing world as invulnerable as possible to communist subversion and, and, and influence. Um, so there are many adjustments. Sp Sputnik, um, you know, scares the hell out of America in many ways. I mean, they, they look, here's this thing, they're convinced that if it can, if the Soviet, the Soviets in 1950, so Sputnik is in 57, um, in 1956, the, so the Soviets successfully launched their first intercontinental ballistic missile. Um, so many Americans see this fact and says, God, you know, these guys can drop a, a, a nuclear bomb sort of on a pinpoint. Um, they have a capability that the United States doesn't have. And actually, for a long time, there's a, there's the Soviets do in certain ways have a capability the United States doesn't have because, among other things, we actually want our missiles to be able to hit a target. The Soviets, they have no idea where they're going to land, but, you know, they're using it for propaganda. We, you know, look what we, we have done. And that included the, 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 um, the satellites themselves, whether they, whatever they carried, whatever their, their payload was. Eisenhower is very aware of this. Um, and, but as I said, that he wants sufficiency. Um, and he's also aware through sort of U-2 satellites and other things that, in fact, the United States does retain a tremendous strategic uh, advantage over the, the, the Soviets, as we there would is, There is a missile gap, but it works in our favor. And in far our Contra favor. what Kennedy, that's, Kennedy that's argues. Absolutely. And, and as, yeah. as, as we, we learned very starkly in the Cuban Missile Crisis, right, when Christian says, holy, look what I did, you know, that... They can blow us off the map. So, um, so what Eisenhower does is that he does authorize um, the development of, of, of sort of some new missiles and puts more money into it than perhaps otherwise he wouldn't. As much as a signal to domestic and to, um, you know, to the Stuart Symingtons and the Democrats who were saying, you know, all of this. Um, but it stays within the general structure of, of what he's going to have, which, again, is that we are not going to bankrupt our country. Um, and we are going to integrate our, our missiles. And we have the triad by then and, and then, you know, into a way that it is rational. We are strong um, and we're going to do everything we can both to avoid a general war and. To, to maintain our economy. And if we do this, he's absolutely convinced that we are going to, quote unquote, win the Cold War. Can I can I foot stomp that point? And I know I'm, we're going over time and I want to be respectful of your time. Um, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, what I, what I, because every week someone writes an op-ed saying we need a Sputnik moment, you know, our STEM problems in education, Obama said we need a Sputnik moment. I, there's like been 20 Sputnik moments, right? Okay, Eisenhower did make important investments in response to Sputnik, but a lot of what he did was to calm everybody down in that's the wake that, of Sputnik and make sure we didn't go overboard, that, which is often the opposite of what these op-eds in the present day suggest. Yeah, no, and, and in fact, um, right around that time, I report it, it's leaked. I mean, it, I, I always said this was... Eisenhower's um, biggest mistake was he, he often put together commissions. I argue that he put together these commissions uh, often to co-opt criticism. You, you get the same people who are criticizing involved in the commission. And they said, see, we let you do it. And we, we use some of your ideas. But, you know, at least you got your day in court. Well, one of these things that had to do with America's um, basically homeland security, if we can use this, and it came out with what we called a Gaither Report. And it, it sort of bought into this, and it, it basically told everyone to go out and build their own fallout shelter. Um, there were other parts to it, but if, if you want to have a domestic public, have an official report that says we all have to build our own fallout shelters and, and, and stock it with like a year's worth of provisions, at, at least. Um, and many people did. So this was right around the time of, of, of Sputnik. Um, and 
uh, Paul Nitze was involved in, in, in that. Paul Nitze had also uh, written the, the NSC 68, had been the primary author. And I've argued that I, you talk about fixing, that Eisenhower made a point of not including Nixon and in Nitze in the Solarium Report, um, but having Ken in. Uh, I feel like there was a prominent book that got that wrong that suggested he was part of it. I wonder if it was Isaacson's The Wise Men or never mind. That's a it, yeah. It could have been, but it's interesting because yeah. I mean I have saw the document in which he, Mitzi says he was originally proposed to be on it, but said I can't do it because I have other commitments. And I'm saying to myself, what other commitments? Did <laughs> That's you right. Send you know I can't do solarium. Um, so in any event, who and he'd also just been sort of let loose from the from the administration. So um, in any case, yes, I, th I think you're absolutely right that uh, Eisenhower's response to the Sputnik movement is let's do as let's do what we need to do to to sort of pacify the the sort of domestic anxiety or to address domestic anxiety and also to placate those Democrats who are going to run in 1966, you know, 60 campaign on the idea that we fell asleep at the switch and we have a missile gap and where, where, you know, Kennedy was more alarmist than, than, you know, almost any, anyone could imagine at that point. Um, but Eisenhower had also set up um, science commissions and, and others. So it's not as if we weren't doing anything during this time. We were studying exactly the issues that then become associated with the, the Sputnik uh, moment. So um, well, Republicans got crushed in 58 too, right? They, At least they, in the Senate. Right. Yeah, like historically. Yeah, not only get crushed, right. They, they, um, William Nolan, who's one of the, the more sort of right wing things in that he 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 loses. He's in California, and he loses his, his Senate race. So, yeah, we're um, and we're also in sort of a depression at that not recession. I mean, the, the economy isn't doing as well, and so here again, um, there are all these advice for Eisenhower to be more Keynesian and pump more money into it, and he says, "No, I'm not going to do that." And that's a reaction to. That's really an electoral issue. The fact that they they lost in '58 and they're going to have to campaign. Nixon will always blame Eisenhower in part for not spending enough money in '60 to 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 help him in the campaign. Well, can I say because you're so the the subtitle of your book is how Eisenhower shaped an enduring Cold War strategy. You and Bowie argue that you know. Truman had some good initial Kennan-esque ideas with NSC 20-4, I believe it was. NSC 68 goes overboard. It's really Eisenhower who makes containment a workable thing that can endure throughout the Cold War wow. with various, you know, changes and different variants of containment. Um, are there prominent Cold War historians that disagree with your and Bowie's assessment of, of the new look? I mean, and is this fight still ongoing? Um, like, would Gaddis say, no, nah, it was actually Reagan no, that perfected? I yeah. think, actually, G Gaddis would pretty much go along with this, with the one exception is that, you know, to him, it always comes back to Kennan, and Kennan was the one who did NSC 20 slash 4. But, um, you know, in his strategies of containment, in which he talks about symmetrical and asymmetrical, that I mean, the, the new look comes out very well. Um, and uh, I don't think there are many historians that, who would disagree with our overall argument that uh, what what can um, part of it is this thing the new look you know which was a fashion statement to, at the time and um, you know there was this idea that the new look that he sort of revolutionized. Uh, what what Truman did. What he really did is he rationalized it. He he took all of the um, ideas that were and the contradictions that really pervaded what Truman had did, which was all a ad hoc reaction to a lot of things that had happened between 1945 and 1952, including the Korean War. Um, and and you know he 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 wove it into a coherent design. And um, subsequent administrations, you know, for Kennedy, in a sense, tried to, to 
move away from what he had into this thing called flexible response. That didn't work out so well. Um, so it's not as if each administration followed the new look, um, sort of religiously or rigorously, but those fundamental and in and, and the terms of the economy, Democrats did tend to spend more um, and were less concerned with balanced budget, accepting sort of the Keynesian thing that over the cycle it would all end up okay. But the administrations did that. One of the things that Eisenhower really did in the new look was for all intents and purposes, bury this concept of rollback in terms of the aggression there. Good pastor is very specific that he sees that's one of the real tangible outcomes of solarium. And it was, I mean, no one even so Reagan, some of the things he said sort of scared people off, but no president after that really does advocate we are going to aggressively roll back the Soviet. We're going to um, negotiations was a big part of the new look and we negotiate. Um, and in fact, it is his it is again, it's Reagan sort of some would say ironical, but but sort of Nixon who's building on that with the salt negotiations and all people might criticize it and they do. But it does follow that that the overall guideline of what the new look was. And, um, you know, I went to, to, to Moscow in, I don't know, I think this was around 1991. And the I and, and um, the Cold War was 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 ending then, but the Soviet Union was unraveling. It hadn't quite unraveled yet, but it was very close to unraveling. And um, one time I was there and Kennan was there and, and basically um, they were toasting Eisenhower. I mean, because Eisenhower, as far as they were concerned, was the one who was most prescient that if you avoid the call, if you avoid a general war, somehow things are going to work out sort of OK. You know, Putin would probably say, well, it didn't really work out OK, um, but it's not over. <laughs> right. It's not over. But in any event, um, I, you know, I think most historians would would generally accept um, this overall view, although they still um, will identify NSC 68 as the seminal Cold War. Um, in fact, I was just in Washington at, uh, the, the, right before we, everything got shut down. That week, I gave a talk in which I challenged that view that NSC 68 was, was, was the seminal thing. And I said it was really 162, too. Uh, well, I agree with you 100 percent. I swear I only have a few more questions before I get in trouble with your family here. Uh, what, do, what do we get mo uh, most wrong about Eisenhower's farewell address? It seems like like Sputnik moments, people are fond of quoting uh, the military industrial complex line. Is there more complexity there than we tend to appreciate? Well, um, I mean, it, so one, it, you know, it, but something that, that he, he was sort of. So Eisenhower was all about sort of values and, and what he defined as the national interest. And he was. Before that, he had talked about the garrison state and was very concerned about this notion of, um, you know, an over militarized society, which was going to impair the values that we had. But he was not he wasn't anti sort of business or anti industry. Um, he was uh, and he wasn't really saying that, you know, there was this revolving door in which politic, you know, government officials were, were going back and forth. He was just um, and originally it was it was also the intelligence community was in there, too. It was a military industrial intelligence complex, um, which actually has a lot of, you know, if, if you go out to Tyson's Corner or something now that said maybe he wasn't all wrong about that. But um, he, you know, he's basically uh, it wasn't so much that he was warning against a military industrial complex is he was putting Americans on notice to 
never lose sight of, of what makes America great, um, of what our values were. And, and uh, so a lot of people have focused on that and said that Eisenhower was was or was aware of this sort of overriding sort of influence that the military could have on society. And he was. But, um, you know, he wasn't telling former government, you know, not to serve on boards or, or, or not to do that. He was it was really that uh, he was warning Americans not to lose sight of what their values were. And it was more. Um, and in fact, what is sort of interesting, given the 1950s and Adam Friedberg writes about this in, in, a, in a, what I think is a really good book, is how small the, industri the military industrial complex was. Um, in contrast to what you think it might have been, given the anxiety of that that period, and I think that that owes a lot to, to who Eisenhower was and what he was trying to do. And it goes back to what he said he was constantly trying to put a lid on not just defense spending, but this sort of Cold War, you know, fear um, that that was consuming everyone. From you know, I, listen. I remember duck and cover when I was a little kid, and uh, you know that's it, it's hard for the people today to actually think in terms of how how much we expected a nuclear war in the 1950s, um, and that's really what he's saying. He said it, it's not the military industrial complex, but don't let sort of the military and because of the fear, sort of undermine all of our values okay second to last question it's a lowbrow question what is the best movie that's ever been made about the cold war has and has there ever been a good eisenhower movie nah there's no good eisenhower i'm so, so the, you know i think there if i go to a movie there, there are two movies i only i never showed many movies but, but one is dr strangelove i mean and part of it is you know, there's just so many different ways that 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 you can um, sort of analyze that. And it's a comedy and, and you know, people like, but I mean, it is really pretty remarkable. Um, and then and the other one, which I keep coming back to, is, is On the Beach. And, and oh, On wow. the Beach, uh, you know, is just I'm I remember seeing it long before I was, you know, I, I, I was probably about, you know, 10, 11 years old. Um, and it was just so sobering. And uh, it is that whole notion in both of them sort of addressing this issue of, I mean, I could go into fail safe and there were just, but it's all about this sort of cloud of, of I mean, I, I want to say nuclear cloud, but separated from sort of the, the image of the mushroom cloud. But yeah. it's always, it's there. Um, and the challenge of how American policymakers were going to address this, both in terms of the domestic fear, but also putting together a strategy that would, um, that was so different. It's a great, I think it's Omar Bradley. Um, this is like, who's, who was still chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff at the beginning of 53. And he said, you know, people talk about a strategy towards Europe that would be a repeat of World War II. And he said, that ain't going to happen. If the, if, the, if the Soviets occupy Europe, we're not going to be able to liberate Europe. We're just going to have to blow Europe off the map. Um, and that's the only way, because you could not liberate it. There could not be a, a, an, an amphibious thing. The, the technology and weapons had gone so far beyond that, so that you had to prevent the occupation from the first place. And that's really what they're, that it, it's all about. Um, and that's why, you know, deterrence becomes so important. I'm going to nominate a third movie to put in that mix, which is a recent one called The Death of Stalin. I don't know if you've seen it. I, I haven't seen it. It's a um, comedy. Yes, I've heard I, I, I will recommend it to you. And I'd be curious to get your thoughts because I think it's brilliant. Okay. okay. Final question for Professor Richard Emmerman eminent Cold War historian, let's say you come to visit Northeast Wisconsin because you're doing some research on Ike and, and Joseph McCarthy, who's from my district, from right. Appleton, well, he's not technically Appleton, but uh, near, nearby. Uh, 
we're having a drink afterwards and a kid in Northeast Wisconsin comes up to you and says, Professor Immerman, I'm a huge fan of your work. I just finished Waging Peace. I am interested in pursuing a career as a historian. Uh, what advice would you have for that young Northeast Wisconsinite? As of right now, I'm going to come in. Don't. I mean, you know, <laughs> I mean, really, it's so, I mean, it's tough. I mean, I think I've had the greatest career anybody can have. Not my career, but in other words, what I did. Um, and, uh, you know, it, 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 you get to develop original questions and then just spend your life trying to answer them. And, and, and so I think most historians love to read mysteries. We love to read detective things. But sort of the stakes are higher, right? We're, we're, we're basically recovering America's past. And I don't think you can understand the present, let alone the future, without understanding where, where we're coming from. Um, but, you know, here's the clicker in particular that is that higher education has been so defunded now. Um, and this is way before the pandemic, which, you know, is, is going to be, I think, the tipping point for a lot of universities that I've been very fortunate. The, I think I've, I've adv I advised over my career something like 40 PhD students and like 37 of them have jobs. Um, that's probably what I'm more proud of than anything else in, 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 in my career. But um, I, 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 would, I would find it really ethically very difficult to accept a student now because of how, how difficult it is to, to get them sort of a job. Um, so if someone from Wisconsin, so my advice to them would be, if you're going to do this, if, if it's your passion, I can never tell you not to pursue your passion. But you have to have your eyes wide open how difficult it's going to be. Um, and you're going to have to do what I did, which is outwork everybody else out there. Um, and uh, you're going to have to take a risk, which, as I mentioned at the beginning, to write a dissertation which someone says can't be done, whether it be because of declassification or whatever it is, so that that dissertation is really going to make people stand up and, and, and notice you. Um, so the, the more conventional dissertations, which, which are still the most, said that you, you can write great, but why are you going to get the job over the, the, the scores and scores of other people who have, are also just as smart as you are and, and just as capable and have done their, the work? So one, you have to work harder. And secondly, you have to come up with a topic that um, is, is really original. And as I... So much is 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 risky. Is um, that you're not going to be sure that you're really going to accomplish your goal until it's over, um, because really no one else has done it for one reason or another. Great advice. Uh, I would tell that kid also to go reread Waging Peace, which is a phenomenal book and one of many great books you've written. Professor Richard Emmerman, you've been exceptionally generous with your time. Thank you for having such a profound effect on my own career, sincerely. Uh, and uh, I just really appreciate this. This was an absolute pleasure. Thank you, sir. Well, thank you so very much. And let's, let's go appropriate more money for higher education. <laughs> <laughs> Do the best, yeah. To do the best, yeah. To do the best, yeah. To do the best, yeah.